thank you for inviting me. And, uh, I hope I can uh, excite and uh, educate in some way. Okay, uh, short background. I, um, I run two companies in Ghana, a software company called The Soft Drive and an e-commerce company called Black Star Line that runs a website called shopafrica53.com. Now, I'm going to talk about aid and how it affects local businesses on the other side, in the countries where the aid goes. Aid, aid goes. Yeah. Now, for clarity, when I say aid, I, I don't mean tsunami relief. That's a one-time event for a terrible catastrophe, and it's quick, and uh, that's it. That's not what I mean. I mean the institutionalized uh, aid, i.e. the axis of evil. <laughs> uh, corrupt governments, uh, residents slash long-term institutionalized aid organizations, and big business. Big, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, Western business. Now, here's what happens. Typically, on our side, we're running in a local economy. We spot a hole in the market. I'm a technology person. We go, we innovate. I mean, today with the internet available across the continent broadly, and especially SMS available, you know, now, now we can innovate. We can start doing things that uh, were not possible before. Typically, what happens is, uh, I'll give you an example. We'll spot a, a problem in the public sector. We will sit around and innovate for six months, come up with a nice solution that works for everybody, that does not require uh, the public the sector company, for example, to pay any money, such that we put it in place, we do a revenue split, works for everybody. Because they've signed all these weird backroom agreements with the institutions that give our governments aid, they listen to our presentation and they say, this is wonderful. This will increase our revenue generation from this sector by 300% or 3,000% and also uh, allow us to facilitate and give a better service to the people. Just a minute though, we need to show it to our aid organizations because we signed a contract that says uh, we, we must not sign a contract without the permission or oversight. So basically, that's the last we hear about this. Uh, six months later, we hear a big announcement. It's a French company coming to do the same thing <laughs> at 10 times the price. And, and guess what? They're also going into Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Nigeria to do the same thing. Our idea, our innovation. We jacked up the price, and the French government, France is just an example of giving. The French government is funding the whole process. And the French government, World Bank, and maybe IFC is an investor. And, and, and this idea came from our labs. So now we've had to learn the very hard lesson of having to avoid the public sector of the government in anything we're doing because that will become the <coughs> stumbling block and they are empowered because they've got money they've got the aid money um, aid is also detrimental in that it allows our governments not to listen to us my government historically has been more interested in putting a smile on the country director for the World Bank's face than you know, poor poor me and also aid is tempting a lot of the aid organizations operate like pimps they have a, a government comes into power, they're having a rough time, you've got two options. They can think through real, long-lasting long solutions that are sustainable. Or there's this pusher standing there saying, take it, take it, take it, take it. And invariably, in a lot of cases, they just take it. They take the drug. And, and, then, they're, and then everybody's happy. <clears throat> they get their kickbacks because the contracts are big and fat. Uh, but by the way, we found out that that 500,000 pounds, the kickback that our friends got in the institution was about 20 times what we were charging for the whole contract. That's why they were so angry. Um, so, essentially, as long as this is going on, it creates friction. And this has happened to, especially me, many times, where I'm public enemy. The government guys hate me. The donor community hates me. And one, one group has the cash, and the other group has the law. So how it manifests is, you know, um, in one year you have six tax audits because they want to find a reason for you not to show up at the next tender. Because they've got a German company they've lined up to take the contract at 300 times the price and, and the, the kickbacks have all been lined up. Right. So I become an irritant to everybody. And in one particular contract, 
I don't want to say the details, but basically it was a national contract. And we got a bunch of Ghanaian companies together, consortium. The equivalent in the UK <coughs> is that you got uh, Rover, Siemens, uh, Plessy, uh, British Telecom, and something else together to execute the contract, to, to bid for the contract. <coughs> first thing we noticed was that the government official who was administering this whole thing came up and said, we want to be clear to everybody, there is no special preference for a local company. Does everybody understand? Because there are 26 international companies in the room. He was advertising, I'll take the kickback, I'll take the kickback. That, that's what he was telling them, essentially. And in the end, we were, uh, they, they, they tried to disqualify us <coughs> on the basis that we hadn't had a big enough turnover in the last five years to qualify to do the contract, and then we got two more partners, and then we had. And then they said, basically, that uh, um, we had to uh, go and find our own financing, at which point the French government stepped in with uh, 30 million euro, and therefore it went to a French company. We didn't give up. We went on the radio and made a lot of noise, and uh, I am loud. <laughs> and as I came out of the radio station, I got a call from the president's office, and who happens to, happen to be a friend of my parents. I said, Henry, what are you doing to us? This is just terrible. You're just despicable. How can you do this to our government? Uh, anyway, so-and-so will call you. Basically, what we ended up with was a horrible subcontract, a loss-making subcontract from the French company, which we are still suffering with today. Basically, they took the worst part of the contract. If, if, if there was a contract to build a train, the, the digging of the, the manual part of the digging of the channels or the tunnels in, in, in rural, rural uh, Britain, that's what they gave us. The, the most difficult part, somewhere in the north, where it's in wintertime, the winter project, that's what they gave us. And, and, and told us, well, we could get a Chinese company to do it for this price, so that's what we're offering. So you just take it. So a bunch of the partners actually made losses. These are the kinds of things that happen. Now note, all these discussions with donor agencies, they're not transparent. They happen in back rooms in Washington and New York and so on. We don't see them as a people. We're blind to all these things, and basically, there's no oversight by the citizens. Please, if I get 18 minutes, somebody please alert me. Okay? As a result, local industry is dying. And then there's constant tension between the political class and the business class. We're constantly competing because they're trying to be the business people, them and the aid people. And we are trying to build an economy. And they don't like that because if we build an economy, there'll be no more aid because to be clear, the country is doing well. So the, the, the mandate in a certain sense, the personal mandates are to hold the country down so the aid keeps coming. It's very easy and you can steal from them. So it's a vicious cycle that creates no development, no tax, uh, no cash for the people, and uh, more aid. And look, I've said already, government focus is not the people, World Bank country director. Now, uh -huh, interesting. It's very difficult to get um, loans and, and credit for business in our part of the world. <coughs> One of the reasons why, the, the banks are not stupid. The banks are quite aware that local businesses are, the, are at the most vulnerable when, when uh, they are operating in their own countries. Guess what will happen? If, if I was doing some, a big software project, even in the private sector, the easiest way for a, a, an international company or a foreign company to get to me would be in my jurisdiction. They will come in, find the right regulator, give them the appropriate amount of money, and, and, and they will shut me down while the foreign company sets up. Mm. The banks understand this. They're not stupid. They've done this business for hundreds of years. As soon as they spot that vulnerability, I can't get a loan. Because they understand they're putting their money into a risky area, which I would not be sensible. Right? Um, and also, there have been governments in, in, in Africa who have tried to kick out this whole racket. They have been vilified by all manner of organizations and institutions, including the Western press. And sometimes they're not vilified for that, they're vilified for something else. Nobody's perfect, but something else is uh, blown up such that they have to leave power. When we, we on the ground, we know the real reason is that they try to push out the whole aid problem. And uh, so they are powerful. Okay. Um, also, uh, we, we, uh, so governments can be changed violently or not. 
through you know, powerful foreign interests. Where government A was doing this, government B wants to change. Um, so basically, poverty, hopelessness, insecurity, centralization, because all the power is in the center. The people on the edges, on the outskirts get nothing. <coughs> Now, if there are no opportunities, and I'm sure a bunch of you are British, aren't you surprised at how many black Africans are trying to come to your country? You know, it's quite clear why. I mean, if, if there are no companies being set up, and you're holding two degrees from Cambridge, and you're walking the streets of Accra, <laughs> what do you do? You work for an NGO, or you, 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 you do, you do six, six fake passports until one gets you through the British High Commission, so you can come and work for the... A British company that has got the contract in Ghana and then transfer back to Ghana. So a lot of our people are doing that. Right. So, okay, just a second, almost there. So the risks are instability, permanent poverty, negative influence from hostile, exploitative foreign interests, and I mean business interests, right? Power and wealth concentrated, overpriced and inappropriate contracting. Sometimes when we go into tenders, we are shocked at what, how far they've pushed the prices because they are able to con the aid organizations so efficiently, i.e. Our, our governments, that everything is just overpriced. You, you'd be surprised at how much a mile of road in Ghana costs. It's, it's like well, record-breaking. Now, on the NGO side, <coughs> it allows special interest groups to push their agenda through our government with the, with the backing of law to get things done in our countries which the citizen we may not want. They're nice jobs for the, for the people with good terms, I've said that. Now, it's really weird, then you end up with a captive borrower. A lot of the aid organizations are giving grants and loans. Can you imagine? So our governments are taking advice from their money lender. That has never been a good policy. I mean, it will keep you in, in, in debt forever because now they have you. They're, they're drug dealers in it. Okay. Um, the solution, we have to lobby to break the axis of evil. Um, thankfully, new technologies are coming up that allow us to do this efficient, efficiently. It makes these things possible, and I'll come back to that. <coughs> um, um, ah, a quick, quick story to show you how disconnected uh, our governments are because of it. <coughs> the other day, a couple of years ago, the Minister of uh, Technology and uh, Communications came to my office and I was shocked. Hey, what does he want? I'm usually talking against. So what does he want in my office? He said, sir, you sit down. There's no problem. Thank you very much. I just needed to meet you. And I said, what happened? He said, no, I went for an African IT conference. And as I walked in, I got a standing ovation. And they, they were talking about this company called Softribe in Ghana and saying Ghana was ahead of everybody. And he had to turn to his assistant and say, what's that? He's never heard of it. <laughs> but he took the standing ovation. And for that reason, he needed to meet me when he came to Ghana. So at least he'll know what he's talking about next time. Not that I saw him again. <laughs> Just say that, oh, I know him. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. Um, okay. Now, we're having to innovate, therefore, to avoid government. Uh, when we work in our labs, if we come up with a new product and we find we need a government license or a government permit or to, to bid for a government contract or something, we send everybody back to the lab. Go six more months, innovate it out of the product because it, it's a liability. When we have even worked and, and, and bid abroad, the, the, the one time we won a contract in a neighboring African country and the last thing they needed to do was to check with our government that we were kosher. They called one of the ministers. He said, hey, we don't know them. Don't talk to them. Look, even our country uses a, 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 an American product. Don't, 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 don't talk to them. We lost the tender. And guess what? On the other side, the, the American company kept telling them, you know, the government uses us. I mean, if, if, if uh, the, the British uh, prime minister wasn't driving a, was driving a, a, a Nissan, I mean, surely I wouldn't buy a British car. And this is the problem we have. And because aid allows them to buy these overpriced things, and those country, uh, the companies in the West are pushing the aid agenda so they can get in, so we lose. So I'm going to tell you the kinds of products that we, we, have, to, we have had to come up with. Um, our our e-commerce business. Um, basically, we are taking Panama registered, servers in Europe, SMS platform in Eastern Europe. This is how we've had to set up. And basically, uh, we're setting up such that in a couple of months, you'll be able to sit here 
and order that African djembe drum you've always wanted off the net. And we use SMS and email to communicate to the bush, and the guy makes it, gets it ready. We have a courier who's communicated to. He picks up and delivers to uh, Nottingham, let's say. And then we pay. Now, first time I spoke about this, everybody would know, one would think, but oh, this is excellent because it bypasses the center, the center and allows regular poor Africans to do international trade. <clears throat> first time I spoke on it on, on air, the, the, the interviewer was so excited. He said, my wife and I could do a beat, beat uh, business behind our house. And, and we know that people in China and people in Europe, they, they like African beats, $10 a pop, and we're in business. Uh, I got called in by the regulator who, who th tried to threaten me. Yeah. And thankfully, I anticipated it because they had purchased an overpriced electronic switch, national switch, right? And they realized what we were doing was bypassing it completely. <coughs> so they, they were looking to stop Stop it. We'll shut you down. I said, we're not registered in Ghana. We will, we will stop your communication. So it comes out of Eastern Europe. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the attitude they had. They said, you, you must pass it through our system. We must get a piece. Because obviously, they're going to take in some aid to put in a switch. And the switch was getting no transactions because it's a primitive switch. So they wanted to use government force to, to skew the market uh, Soviet style. It doesn't work. That's an example of something we did. The other thing, the, the only good thing is that because governments are generally so inefficient, we, we have had, we've been able to come up with products that beat, that, that replace the services they are not doing properly. I'll give you an example. There's an emergence of armed robbery in Ghana. We come up with a product that essentially allows you for $10 a month, similar to what uh, you were saying, $10 a month, um, if you get attacked, and but we work on scratch cards, something you might be interested in. So you don't even have to. We don't even have to see. You, you sign up. Uh, we learned this from the uh, Arab Spring, <coughs> and the British Spring, the, all the communication that took place. <laughs> so we got the idea. We put it together. It's launching next week. Basically, if you get attacked in your house, boom, 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 open the door. Five five phones from your house can send a text or just call a number. You don't, you don't even have to talk. And there is complete mayhem after that because we will send a private security company to your house immediately. They come in with the dogs and everything, including a webcam, right? Two, that's nothing. Two, more interesting, we will immediately alert 10 of your neighbors that you're under attack. And in Africa, we don't really fear the police, we fear the mob action. Because <laughs> they'll come out and beat you to death. <laughs> the neighbors will come out all the holding sticks and stones and the dogs and everything. Uh, it gets even better. That we've done deals, all, all this was done low budget, very efficient. We did, uh, the, the next thing that happens is that, oh, by the way, while all this is happening, I'm asleep. It's all handled by the technology. The third thing that happens is the radio stations are, today the president visited the US. Sorry, there's a house under attack. It's opposite, opposite Marble Arch. Near St. Paul. So, no, no, anybody in the area. So, it will basically render that impossible. But this is possible because the police are so inefficient. So, we tell them, as a formality. <laughs> <laughs> because they're so inefficient. And then the last thing we do is that we, we triangulate on GPS and, and circle the crime by a mile, telling everybody who's relevant there, they block the roads and all that. These are the kinds of things we have to come up with. In terms of a, and, and the pay-as-you-go model works very well. We found that uh, the tel telcos made a lot of money and continue to, and because uh, people don't have money, so they, they can't pay $10,000 for something. They pay little by little, just as I said, totally agree. So, for example, in, in his uh, realm, we're just launching a school product where uh, all these poorer schools could not afford computers. We are giving them computers with internet access dongles, which are available for the whole country. Ghana is quite fairly well covered. A lot of African countries are. And basically, they, they pay $1 a month per, per student, right? And for that, they suddenly have a world-class uh, system to monitor the report cards, and so and so attendance. Um, it sends SMSs to the parents, so they are in there. Uh, your child is late, uh, so and so holidays tomorrow, and <clears throat> basically they can have something the quality of what one a school could have here, but in, in a small village school. So we think that that's very exciting. <coughs> exciting. Um, uh, 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 also. We are also looking, and it's interesting that I bump into Professor Tully. We're, we're on our website, Shop Africa 53, we don't own the goods. 
right? We don't own the goods. The goods belong to, yeah. we're just giving them the international, we're turning them into multinationals. We hope they don't get evil. <laughs> but we're turning them into multinationals. They're all these small businesses, right? Across the continent. Now, one of the things we're looking to do, we're working with our, our friends in education on it, is to have and something similar to what he's doing, but a central, very qualified teacher who can teach across a bunch of branded schools off our website. And it will be a function of you buy a scratch card on the street, you scratch maybe three dollars, and you go on, and for the day, you can, your students can join the class, essentially. So you might even have a teacher that's not so good, but every Thursday and every Friday, you log on to the national system, and in the big city, there's a, a, a very well-paid teacher, but he's talking to, to 300,000 students at once. And then the student, the, the, prof the, the lecturer on the other side, uh, then explains what he said. Those kinds of solutions. <coughs> so um, I, I'm going to conclude. Um, I think also that uh, you, you talk about corruption in Africa. There's corruption here too. How does it happen? Send the money to Africa. <laughs> Even if it gets stolen, don't forget that the distribution includes people from here. In a lot of cases, the bigger share comes here. And even if it gets stolen, you know, we all know the history. And so, oh, you know, you know how the Africans are? <laughs> they to maniacs. And they, yes, they would be, wouldn't they? They've just, just been robbed on this side. Taxpayers' money from here. I mean, when I come here and I see people begging at the train stations, I can't imagine how they allow their government <laughs> to give our people money, which they then spend on Mercedes Benz. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. So everybody's losing. Right? And um, um, if people in aid really want to help the developing world, you want to help places like Africa, I, I argue that uh, with the clout they have with the government, they should invest in local companies, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's profitable too, huh? with your 1% or 2% return here, you get far better returns where I come from. Far, far better. Young population growing. This is the time to channel the aid money and you can even recycle it, put it in for five years, pull it back out, help somebody else, pull it back out. And with the, with the clout, make the government behave and not take bribes along the way when you're trying to deliver something. That's what the clout, I think, should be used for. And uh, with the eight people, there's a moral thing here. I mean, show me your friends, I'll, I'll tell you who you are. And when you come to my country, and of all the people you could partner with, you partner with uh, kleptocrats, mm, you have to worry. Um, sounds cliche, but what we want is a handshake and a business deal, not a handout. Thank you very much.